Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Raghi Assad. I am a visiting professor at the Economics Department. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker and also uh, say a couple of words about our hosting organization, which is the Alternative Policy Solutions Project, which is a research project here at AUC that is, uh, whose goal is to uh, basically come up with policy solutions that are uh, executable, that could be adopted by a government that would be alternative in the sense that they would have uh, social justice as one of their important uh, objectives, as well as uh, the usual objectives of promoting uh, growth and economic development. And there are already a, a number of uh, policy solutions that have been worked on by this project. Uh, uh, on tax policy, on, uh, uh, on uh, guaranteed income for the population, on education. Uh, so I would uh, at least uh, urge you to uh, keep looking for some of the products of the Alternative Policy Solutions Project. Um, but I'm uh, absolutely delighted uh, to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, John Romer is the Elizabeth S. and uh, Varick Stout Professor of Political Science and Economics at Yale University. Uh, his work concerns the intersection of political economy, political philosophy, and economic theory. Uh, his current interests include constructing the micro foundations for human cooperation, a topic that has been ignored by economic theory despite its extreme importance uh, in explaining how uh, the success of the human species. Uh, this is today's uh, topic of today's lecture. And he, uh, John will be talking about his uh, upcoming book uh, that is in press on how we cooperate a Kantian explanation. Uh, John is a fellow of the Econometric Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and a past fellow of the Russell, Russell Sage Foundation and the Guggenheim Foundation. And he also holds uh, honorary doctorate degrees from the University of Athens and Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and is, his actual PhD is from Berkeley. Uh, he's also the past president of the Society for Social Choice and Welfare. He has a long list of very influential books that uh, have influenced me and my work quite a bit. Uh, uh, I'll read you some of the titles. A General, Theory, General Theory of Exploitation and Class, which was published in 1982. Theories of Distributive Justice, published in 1996. Equality of Opportunity, published in 1998. Political Competition, published in 2001. Racism, Xenophobia and Distribution, published in 2007. And Sustainability for a Warming Planet, published in 2015. So you can see the range of things that uh, John writes about. Uh, I was particularly influenced by his work on equality of opportunity. And in fact, I had uh, the, the good fortune of being able to co-author uh, an article with him on uh, equality of opportunity or inequality of opportunity in Egypt. Uh, and this is a topic that we will be discussing on Tuesday in a public lecture at Oriental, Oriental Hall on the Tahrir campus at 6 p.m. So I hope all of you can join us uh, then as well. So uh, please join me in welcoming John Roman. Thank you, Raghi, for that generous uh, introduction. Is this loud enough? OK. Uh, this is, I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on for a decade, well, actually longer than that. but intensively for a decade, which will be published as a book later this year by Yale University Press called How We Cooperate, a Kantian Explanation. Now the Kantian Explanation, I'm going to just give you a clue as to what that is. Immanuel Kant was probably one of the greatest uh, philosophers in the 18th century, German, and he had a, he had a, a moral uh, a view about morality, about ethical behavior, uh, which was summarized in something that he called the categorical imperative. And the categorical imperative was take those actions that you would wish to see 
universalize. How many of you have heard of uh, the categorical imperative before? Okay, a fair number. Take those actions that you would will be universalized. So don't do something unless you'd be happy if everybody did it, likewise. So I'm going to base my theory of cooperation on that viewpoint, as you'll see. Uh, I thought this was going to be a lecture given to mainly to economics faculty, but I, I guess unless you're all very, uh, 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 what's the word, for young people who are very accomplished, uh, precocious, you're not the faculty by and large, you're students, so I'm going to try to say something a little uh, more foundational than I would have otherwise said. How many of you are economics students? Okay, and of those, how many of you are somewhat familiar with game theory? And of though, and if you're familiar with game theory, you're probably familiar with the notion of Nash equilibrium. How many of you are familiar with Nash equilibrium? Okay, good. So you have a good basis for my talk. Nash equilibrium is one of the probably two most important game theory uh, with its equilibrium concept of Nash equilibrium is probably one of the two most important theories which model how humans compete with each other in economic activity. It's called a non-cooperative equilibrium, as you know. Uh, the other important theory, uh, equally important, I would say, to Nash equilibrium and game theory, is general equilibrium theory, also associated with an equilibrium concept called Valrhesian equilibrium or competitive equilibrium or sometimes market equilibrium. And this is the second major theory that really began with Adam Smith in 1776 when he published his book called The Wealth of Nations, attempting to explain how the income distribution is determined in a market economy. That is to say, given uh, a set of people who have preferences over goods uh, and labor, and given a set of firms that have certain technologies for producing goods, what can we, and these individuals who are workers, who are consumers, also have certain skills, what can we expect to see in a market economy as the distribution of income that evolved? I mean, that, you can see what a hugely important question that is. And economics worked on that question for roughly uh, 200 years before it came up with what you could call a, a nice solution, a mathematical solution, a statement that could be made formally with mathematics uh, explaining how the fundamentals of, of an economy, which is to say the endowments of individuals and their preferences and the technologies for producing goods, would determine finally a set of prices and a set of income for all the members of society. Hugely important question. And that was called general equilibrium theory. The people who really put the final dots on the I's and crosses on the T's of that theory were two economists, Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Debreu, who in 1954 published uh, uh, the model of an economy which was a generalization of a model of, a, of thoughts that had begun with Adam Smith in 1776. Anyway, the ma major, ma basic fact about these two models, game theory associated with the name John Nash, and you may have seen a movie about John Nash. How many of you have seen A Beautiful Mind? Okay, great. So even more of you have seen that than, no, than say they know something about game theory. Well, a beautiful, that, it deserved, Nash deserved to have a movie made about him uh, because this idea was a transformative idea in economics, Nash equilibrium. So that idea and the general equilibrium theory do uh, in the last instance to these two uh, economists, one American and one Frenchman, Arrow and Debreu, who both got the Nobel Prize, incidentally. Nash also got the Nobel Prize, so all three of them did. Uh, these are theories which uh, are beautiful theories. They're great accomplishments of social science in my view because they distill vague ideas and make them precise with a mathematical language, which is a very important thing to do because then anybody can use that language. Anybody can learn it and use that language. But they're models of how 
economic agents compete with each other. Now, the fascinating thing, if you think about it, is that only uh, a part of our economic activity consists of competing with each other. A very large part of our economic activity consists in cooperating with each other. And the amazing thing is that um, economics has almost nothing to say about how people cooperate with each other. Now let me give some examples of cooperation. Well, we cooperate all the time. We cooperate each other with each other when we're, we have any tasks to perform. We often perform them together with other people. And that requires cooperation. That doesn't require competition. It requires cooperation. Well, maybe there could be some competition. We could, it could be like a race that we're competing with other people to see who gets there first. But a lot of production has to do with cooperation. Within firms, we cooperate with each other. Different members of the firm have to somehow coordinate what they're doing, not primarily compete with each other, but cooperate to produce the commodities that the firm is producing. When we have a government that taxes its citizens, uh, that involves cooperation. We, we pay our taxes mainly, I'm speaking now mainly of advanced democracies. I realize in Egypt you have a, a problem with tax collection because it's a not as cooperative a society as the advanced democracies. But in the advanced democracies, people pay their taxes and, the ta and they have to trust the state is going to use the taxes for the benefit of the population. So the taxes are invested in public goods or in transfer payments or in social insurance or in health service or in defense, all things which are supposed to be in the interest of the people. So in, a, in an advanced democracy like uh, uh, the most advanced democracies are Northern Europe, the Nordic countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, or two more Nordic countries, do you know what they are? That's one, and the other one? Iceland, very good. So Denmark, Sweden, and Norway are called the Scandinavian countries, and then when you include Finland and Iceland, they become the Nordic countries. Anyway, those countries collect as taxes, as it, from income taxes, about what percentage of the gross national product? I don't want a teacher to answer, I want a student to answer this about what percentage of the gross national product is collected in taxes in the Nordic country? About 50%. A little more in Sweden, maybe a little less in Iceland, but about 50%. In Germany, as you go down in Europe, the figure falls. In Germany, it's still over 40%. In France, it's probably 40%. In the United States, it's 31%. So we're the most... Uh, the least cooperative of the major advanced democracies. But still, 31% is not bad. I don't know what the figure is in Egypt. Does anybody know? Raghi, what is it? How much? 12%? OK, so you're way down in your level of cooperation as measured by that. But it, the interesting thing is human societies have now grown to be hundreds of millions of people who live basically peacefully together in large cities. I mean, murder rates are trivial, right? I mean, three per 100,000 per annum or something. I mean, they're not large. So we live together in these big societies, even bigger countries where we don't, we're not constantly at war with each other. There are countries with civil wars, but it's a relatively rare event, especially as the countries become more advanced. So if you compare that to uh, an animal, a tribe of chimpanzees that lives in a group of between, say, 30 and 50 or 80, and can't grow larger than that, largely because they don't have the ability to cooperate with each other. So cooperation is a huge part of our uh, toolkit, which helps us not only in everyday life, because we don't kill each other on the roads, we cooperate in traffic, but also in economic activity, we cooperate all the time. It's a little weird that economic theory has not tried to model cooperation. The only models we have 
I could put a little footnote on that, but the, basically the only models we have, the two great models we have, game theory and competitive equilibrium, are models of competition. Why, don't, why haven't we modeled how we cooperate? So that's what I'd like to start to do with my work, to model how we cooperate. So can I have the first slide? So there's a evolutionary psychologist named Michael Tomasello who has done some wonderful experiments that demonstrate that among the five species of great ape, that's the group we belong to, those five species are humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and bonobos. We are the only ones who cooperate with each other to any significant degree. And he does these wonderful experiments where he gets two infants uh, who have to cooperate to get some food or some candy. And then there's a parallel experiment with two chimpanzees who have to cooperate to get some food. And the infants always succeed in doing it. It's natural. They figure out how to cooperate to get the food. The chimpanzees don't because they maybe try once to cooperate to get the food, but then they fight over it. They can't share it. So it's not worth the cooperative effort to get the food. It's not that much food and it's not worth fighting over it, and so they don't do it again. So it's a beautiful experiment, and he's done it in many, many versions. Amicello claims that the capacity to cooperate is ingrown, it's, we are born with it, and it evidently came from the common ancestor to these five great apes. We don't know who the common ancestor was, what the name, we don't have a name for that species. We don't have any archaeology. We have not discovered the skeleton of the common ancestor. But his view is that the common ancestor must have possessed this ability to cooperate with others, which we got, it was passed down to us, but it was not passed down to the other four species of great ape. So some pieces of evidence about our ability to cooperate. Among the five great apes, humans are the only ones who point and mime, you know, imitate an animal. So why are we the only ones? Because Amicello says hunt, uh, pointing and miming were primitive forms of language which were useful in hunting. But they were only useful in capturing prey if you cooperated with the other person. I mean, you didn't need to hunt and to point and mime if you, could, if you did all your hunting by yourself. But if you wanted to catch a large animal, which you couldn't do by yourself, but you could with someone else and share it, uh, it was useful to be able to point in mind. Chimpanzees don't point. Surprising. Even when they're with other humans and trying to communicate with humans, they don't point, nor do they mime. The other, another, I shouldn't say the other, and other piece of evidence, which is very interesting, is the fact that only humans have sclera. The sclera is the white of the eye. Why is that interesting? Because it's only because we have whites in our eyes that you can see what I'm looking at, unless I move my head. If I go like that, you can see that I'm looking over here at her. It's only because I have whites in the eyes. If your eye were totally black, you can't see that. Again, it has been shown, it has been hypothesized by biologists that that was useful in hunting. It's useful for, if you and I are going to try to catch that animal, it's useful for me that you could see what I'm looking at, and then we can go capture the animal together. Wouldn't have been useful if we weren't naturally cooperator. Language is obviously the main example of the evolution of something which was extremely useful in cooperation, but would not have been terribly useful in a non-cooperative species. Why? Because of the problem of what game theorists call cheap talk. Why should you believe anything I'm saying to you if we're competitors? I would just be trying to mislead you, right? Because I want the good stuff for myself. So uh, these examples show that our indicative of the fact that only humans really have this ability to cooperate. So a fortiori, we should be trying, we economists should be trying to provide 
a model for how people cooperate. Micro foundations in the sense that Nash equilibrium provides a micro foundation for how people compete with each other. Could I have the next slide, please? So economics does have a theory of cooperation. So I now want to back off and say that I've been, I have not been telling you the entire truth. The entire truth is economics does have a theory of cooperation, but I think it's a kind of a weird theory. Economics tries to explain cooperation as a non-cooperative equilibrium of a multi-stage game. So here's the idea. Suppose the game is a uh, prisoner's dilemma. How many of you remember the prisoner's dilemma? Okay, good. I actually have a slide. Could we advance a few slides? To my, that's why it's nice for me to do it myself. But keep going, please. Keep going. There it is. That's it. Okay, so here's the payoff matrix of the prisoner's dilemma. So there are two strategies that are usually called cooperate and defect. There's a row player who we think of as choosing the row of the matrix. And there's a column player who we think of as choosing the column of the matrix. And these numbers give the payoffs to the row and the column player respectively at any point, at any of the four cells in the matrix. So if the first player, if the row player plays the top row and the column player plays the second column, then these are the payoffs, they both get zero. Okay, so what is the Nash equilibrium of this game? How many of you know what it is? What's the non-competitive equilibrium, what non-cooperative equilibrium of this game? You don't remember. Okay, so the answer is they play, they both play D. They both defect. They both defect. And what's the logic behind that? Well, it's the logic of Nash equilibrium. So let me explain it to you. Suppose they were playing in this corner, CC. CC is much better for both of them than DD, right? They both get a payoff of one here. And here they get a payoff of zero. But CC is not stable under Nash reasoning. Why? Because suppose the column player switched to D, holding fixed what the row player is doing. Hold fixed that at C. Column player shifts to playing D, so he moves the solution to this. And two is greater than one. That's the column player's payoff. So he's going to do that move. So this is not a stable point, right? Is this stable? Would it be stable for the second guy to play D and the first guy to play C? Is this stable? What should the row player do here? The row player is playing the second row now, right? What should the row player do? The row player should shift to the first row. No, I'm sorry. The row player should shift where? What, where should the column player shift here? The column player should shift to the second column, because then his payoff would increase from minus 1 to 0. So this is not stable either. Turns out this is not stable either, but this is stable. Well, let's check it. Here the row player is playing the second row, the column player is playing the second column. Can the column player profitably change the column he's playing? No, because if he shifts to here, he gets minus one. Can the row player shift profitably from what he's doing, given what the column player is doing? No, because if he shifts to here, he goes from zero to minus one. So the unique stable point, or what we call the unique Nash equilibrium, is they both defect on each other. What's the game that is usually, what is the real life situation that's uh, often given as, a as, the, as the thing which this matrix models? Well, it's called the prisoner's dilemma because it's based on the following story. There are two uh, thieves who've been caught. They were carrying out a uh, robbery together. They've been caught. 
And uh, the situation is this. The prosecutor doesn't have enough evidence that they committed the crime unless he can get one of them to testify, to turn state's evidence and say that, yes, he did commit. So the prosecutor offers each of them, they're not together, they're in different cells, and he offers each of, the, each of them a light sentence if he turns state's evidence against the other. Okay? However, if one person turns state's evidence and the other doesn't, then the one who doesn't gets the book thrown at him. He gets a very heavy sentence. Whereas if they both, you know, button their lips and neither one testifies, then he can only give them each a light sentence. So that gives rise to these payoffs. So this situation here is a situation where the column player turns state's evidence, so he gets a good payoff, but the other guy gets the book thrown at him. This is the situation where they both keep their, they both keep their silence, so they both get a sentence. Sorry. This is where they both keep their silence, right? So they both get a reasonably good payoff, not as good as if one cheated on the other, but they get a reasonably good, you know, a small sentence. This is where they both turn state's evidence and he can convict them, them of the crime. They get a bigger sentence. But the worst sentence is to the guy who cooperates when the other one defects. So that's a Nash equilibrium. Now, the standard explanation for how people cooperate is that um, you have to embed this game in a multi-stage game, that it's going to be played many times. And the idea is this. In the first play, they get to choose cooperative defect. In the second stage of the game, if one player has defected, uh, then the other should punish him. But punishing has a cost. It's not, it's not costless to punish somebody else. I mean, if you try to beat him up or slit his throat, he may try to, you know, fight you back. So there has to be a third stage of the game in which if somebody didn't carry out, this is hard to imagine with two people, so imagine it's with many more people. There has to be a third stage of the game such that someone who is supposed to be a punisher of defectors in the second stage who didn't carry out the punishment himself gets punished. And there has to be a fourth stage of the game so that the person who was supposed to carry out the punishment against the one who failed to punish, if he didn't carry out what he was supposed to do, he has to get punished. So if you have the game with an infinite number of stages, or with a finite number of stages which is unknown, it's never known what the last stage will be by anybody, if you have such a game, it's possible to design an equilibrium with punishments which is a Nash equilibrium, that is to say, which has the property that each person shouldn't deviate from what, from, the, from what he's supposed to do at each stage of the game, in which everybody cooperates the whole time. And that basically is the only good explanation, I mean, the only rigorous explanation of how people cooperate according to standard game theory. Now, my reaction to that explanation is it's too complicated. I mean, you may think economics is complicated, but the sign of good explanations is they're reasonably simple. It's reasonably simple. So what do I propose in this game? What is the cooperative way to play this game? I say that when people cooperate, they learn to think in the following way. When they see a situation like that, which is symmetric, each of us are symmetrically placed with respect to the payoff, um, I don't think in the terms of Nash. I don't necessarily think, if I'm a cooperator, I don't necessarily think, what's the best thing for me to do given what the other, what I, what the other guy is doing? I think we're both similarly situated. We're both equally intelligent. We're both come from the same culture, perhaps. I'm going to play the action I would like both of us to play. So I ask myself the question, 
given that we play the same action, which is pretty likely because we're going to reason in the same way, we're probably going to come to the same conclusion. So given that we're going to play the same action, that restricts us to the main diagonal of this matrix. Given that we're going to play the same action, that's my hypothesis, what is the action I would like that to be? It's cooperate, because 1 is greater than 0. So that's what I call Kantian optimization. I ask myself, what is the action I'd like both of us to play? And why is that Kantian? Because I'm asking myself the categorical imperative question. Take those actions that you would wish to see universalized. Okay, and notice that gets me the good solution. We're both better off in that solution than if we play non-cooperatively and get zero, zero. We're both better off. This solution is called Pareto efficient. This is Pareto inefficient. Pareto efficient means there's no state of the world which can make both of us better off. This is Pareto inefficient because this state of the world makes us both better off. So the virtue of that kind of Kantian optimization is that it results in a Pareto efficient allocation. Okay, so that's the introduction to this idea. Um, let me go back to the beginning slides and see what I missed. Could we go on one? Let me skip that. Okay, what is the source of cooperation? It's solidarity and trust. So I'm not saying people always cooperate. The situation has to be solidaristic and there has to be trust. What does solidarity mean? It means not what you perhaps think it means. It doesn't mean that we feel something about other people. It doesn't mean the action we take. It's a description of our situation and in particular, it's a, it says a community experiences solidarity just in case its members have common interests and must work together to address them. That's from the American Heritage Dictionary. So the translation of that in, in game theory is that we are in a symmetric game. We're all similarly situated in the game, the way we were in the payoff matrix of the prisoner's dilemma. It's not altruism. I don't require that you care about me. In the case of the prisoner's dilemma, when I motivated playing the Kantian action, I'm doing it because it's best for me. But it's best for me trusting that you're going to think the same way, and also, and we're going to end up choosing the same policy. So my trust is that you're going through the same thought process I'm going through. That's trust. Okay, now trust is more likely to happen in a community of people who interact with each other all the time or who have the same culture or the same religion or speak the same language. All these things that make people more similar are going to breed solidarity, the feeling that we are all in a common situation and face the same enemy, so to speak, right? So, I'm, so that's the situation. Tahir Square, do you think you can explain that as a Nash equilibrium or as a Kantian equilibrium. Thousands of people come out in the street. It's dangerous, but people do it. Well, if you were thinking in the Nash way, how would you think? You'd say, well, I can either go out and participate or I can stay in my apartment. If I go out and participate, I'll make some very, very small increase in the probability that the demonstration will have a good outcome, that is to say, we'll overthrow the government or something like that, right? Very small probability. On the other hand, the danger to me of going out in the, in, in the square uh, is I might get shot or beat or trampled or whatever. There's some significant danger to me. Maybe a small probability, but as long as the expected um, disutility to me, as long as the expected cost to me of joining the demonstration is greater than the infinitesimal increase in the probability of making the demonstration succeed by my participation, 
a Nash optimizer won't go out in the square, right? A Nash optimizer might care about winning, you know, that's not, that's not what gets them to go out. A Nash optimizer only participates if the expected cost to him is less than the marginal increase in the benefit that he conveys on the demonstration by participating. So what's the Nash equilibrium? Assuming it's the case that the expected uh, cost is greater than the marginal difference that one person makes in the success of demonstration, what's the equilibrium in Tahir Square? Nobody participates. And that's the general result of Nash equilibrium in the production of a public good. The demonstration was a public good. That is to say, it was going to do everybody who participated some good. I mean, if it succeeded, right? But the problem with public goods is that the individual cost to participating in the production of the public good is usually greater than the very small increase in the size of the public good that one's participation makes. And so the general problem is that we don't produce public goods in competitive situations. Content equilibrium, however, explains it. I say to myself, would I rather everybody participate or nobody participate? That's the question. Well, I'd rather everybody participate, so I should participate. There is a morality involved, right? It's a morality in how we optimize. Um, I'm going to give a few more examples, and I'm going to stop, right? So let me see my list of examples. Here are a bunch of examples of where I think we observe Kantian equilibrium and not Nash equilibrium. The first is recycling. You recycle here in Cairo? Moderate. Okay. So usually when you recycle, you have to make a choice as to do you, do you just throw all your garbage in one can or do you put it in different cans. You may have to carry the recycled can to a special place to deposit it, whatever. So there's a little cost in recycling to the individual. The benefit that the individual's participation makes in creating a clean environment by recycling is, is infinitesimal, right? <laughs> probably more, probably less than the personal cost to you. Again, I'm not asking you how much do you like a clean environment. I'm asking what difference does your participation in the recycling effort make to the clean environment? And the answer is very, very little. So if, in fact, the cost to you is greater than that marginal benefit you make, you shouldn't recycle. So the recycling equilibrium should be zero. Nobody should recycle. But we do observe maybe 60% or 20 I don't know what it is. In New York City, where I live, I think it's probably 60 70% of people recycle. Why don't the other recycle? The others are Nash players. So I'm not saying everybody is a cooperator. The others, are, the others are thinking, well, I may like a clean environment, but it's not worth it to me to contribute to it. That's the Nash reasoning. So I'm not saying everybody's a cooperator, but I think that explains why we see such large cooperation. Think of that explanation of the multi-stage game with punishments. Do you get punished if you don't recycle? Well, normally nobody sees whether you recycle or not. There's no issue of punishment. There's no issue of being seen. Second example is voting. That's, voting is a big paradox for political scientists. Why do people vote in such large numbers, especially in a country where you're not penalized for not voting? Very few countries penalize you. Some countries fine you for not voting. Most countries don't. Yet we see large numbers of people voting. And the, the cost of voting is often non-trivial. You have to take some time off work or out of your day. You may even have to stand in line for an hour to vote. It's a non-trivial cost, and the benefit you make to voting, namely the very small difference you make in the probability of your candidates winning, is probably less than the cost of voting. But many, many people vote. I say they're reasoning in the Kantian manner. They're saying, what is the action I'd like everyone to take? Well, if, I, if we're in a democracy, then I value democracy. And I vote because I'd rather everybody vote than nobody vote. Or I might limit it to the, the people who are voting on my side. 
for my candidate. I might li limit the Kantian reasoning to that group. Would I like everybody who supports my candidate to vote or none of the people who support my candidate to vote? Well, I'd like everybody to, so therefore that's the Kantian action. A third example is tipping. Why do people tip in restaurants? Well, often you're not, I mean, take the case where you're not going to see the waiter again. Nobody sees really whether you tip or not. Why do you tip? There's a cost to you. The benefit you make to the waiter's salary is really pretty small. So why do you do it? I think in many cases it's Kantian. It's I want to do the right thing. Let me say something about doing the right thing. Why is it the right thing? It's the right thing because that's what everybody should do. So when people say, oh, I'm tipping because I want to do the right thing, or I'm recycling because I want to do the right thing, I think that's really equivalent to the Kantian explanation. It is the right thing because it's the Kantian action. Um, doing my bit in the Second World War in England, there was a mass movement of people doing something a little extra for the war effort that wasn't required, working on a Saturday or you know something. It was called Doing My Bit. And if you read novels about the war in England or you see television series about it, you hear the expression all the time, I'm doing my bit. That was, I think, a mass example of Kantian reasoning. Well, I know Raghi wants me to stop, so we have some time for questions. So I'll, I'll conclude with that. So let's take some two or three questions and then uh, we'll hear the answers. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. The first question, in the early 80s, there was some research by Axel Roth, who wrote about the evolution of co -op cooperation, the complexity of cooperation, and he actually starts with the game theory mindset. But then he gets exactly similar to what you're saying. He gets into altruism, and he talks about trust. But he looks at it from an evolution perspective. He says, well, his co-author, his co-researcher was actually a biologist. So he was looking at it to evolve, you need to cooperate. Now this is one. The other is about trust. Interesting, when you talk about literature in supply chain, for example, or how do you form uh, alliances, people start talking about trust. And the same thing also in the literature for project management in unknown unknowns, which is the ultimate uncertainty. And then they talk about trust, but they, they look at two parts of trust. I trust you because you're competent, and I trust you because I trust your motives. And to trust, I really have to have both, which makes it complex. So I just wanted to know your... Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to have these examples you give about trust, because that makes perfect sense to me. And what I want to point out to you, just to push my program further, is Trust is absolutely irrelevant for a Nash player. I don't have to trust anything about your behavior. I don't have to talk with you at all. Why? Because I'm doing the best thing for me given what you're doing. And in a Nash equilibrium, everybody is doing the best thing for himself given what all the others are doing. And so it's a stable point. There's no trust. I don't, there's no issue in talking to other people. So whenever we talk about trust being important in a situation, it can't be a Nash equilibrium that we're talking about. So on Axelrod, Axelrod's famous contribution was the tit-for-tat strategy. Uh, Axelrod ran a tournament of playing uh, Prisoner's Dilemma in an iterated game, iterate many stages, and he asked game theorists to come up with proposals for how they would play it. And he showed that the tit-for-tat strategy that I won't go into now actually defeats most of the other strategies that were proposed. So tit-for-tat was an example. Of th there is punishment in tit-for-tat. Here's how it works. I sim I'm the second player. Let's say it's a prisoner's dilemma. I simply copy what you're doing. So if you play cooperate, I play cooperate in the next round. We both play something. But then in the second round, if you played cooperate, I played cooperate. If you played defect, then I played defect. And if you have a tit for tat strategy that's what's called forgiving, that is to say you only punish for a certain number of periods, you don't do it forever, then tit for tat 
actually evolves eventually into plane cooperation all the time. That's the, what Axelrod showed. So Axelrod ha had very good ideas, and he also, when he talks about trust, you know, I think is really onto something, but he never formalized the idea as a proposal for an alternative to Nash equilibrium. What I'm proposing is a formal game theoretic definition of how well, optimization, which will in many games deliver Pareto efficient solutions. Can I take maybe a couple of questions? Us as humans, we're the only ones that are capable of um, coordinate, coordinating with each other as opposed to, I don't know, chimpanzees or orangutans. But I, you didn't mention, like, I know there's a difference between capabilities and actually having the incentive to do that. I know, I understand your Pareto efficient argument. However, we don't, us as humans, especially when there are large things at stake, like competitive firms, we don't we don't go for a zero, zero. We go for the other firm having a minus one and us being a two. That's the thing. So I don't understand what, what, what incentivizes us to actually have an all benefit, to have a benefit for both of us benefiting because my loss is your gain and vice versa. It's, that's how I think it's a zero sum game. So what incentivizes me to actually follow this? Okay, good question. Uh, so let me give some answers. First of all, I was talking about cooperation within the firm, not between firms. And if you look at the Japanese firm, one of the reasons that it was so successful in displacing the American automobile firms and becoming the biggest producer of automobiles in the world was because there was lots of cooperation in the Japanese firm within the firm, which was lacking in the American firm. The Japanese worker had much more control over the production process. One example was this. Any, in the Japanese auto firms, on the assembly line, there's a button above every worker's spot where he can stop the assembly line by pressing the button. And he would use it if there was a defective you know, piece of stuff coming through on the assembly line. In the United States, when the Japanese toured the American firms and they saw there were no buttons, they suggested to the Americans that they install these buttons. They said it's really going to increase the quality of the cars you produce because workers will see problems, they'll stop the button and they'll take that piece off to be repaired. The Americans said, oh, we can't do that. We wouldn't have any production. People would be stopping the line all the time. So that's an example of cooperation within the firm. Now I'm going to talk about cooperation between firms. If you have two oligopolists, what they will try to do is set a price, or three oligopolists, doesn't matter. If you have a small number of oligopolists producing the same good, what they, re what they try to do is to set the price at the level that maximizes the joint profits. That's illegal in most countries because it's bad for consumers. But that's the Kantian equilibrium for the oligopolists. The oligopolist is to choose the price that I would like all of us to choose, the price that will maximize my profits. Well, typically, maximizing my profits, if we're all equally have the same technologies, that maximizes joint profits. So the price collusion among oligopolists is what they try to do if it's not illegal. Of course, bad for consumers, but for the group of oligopolists, if that constitutes the game, they should play the Kantian equilibrium. The third point is, if the stakes are high enough, people may compete. They might not cooperate. So I'm not saying cooperation is universal. It depends upon the degree to which people view themselves as being in a solidaristic situation with other people. So you see workers in a firm cooperating to go out on strike. You don't often see workers and the boss of the firm playing together a Kantian equilibrium. But you do see the workers playing it when they go out on strike. Thank you first for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have a kind of a comment uh, and um, a general question. Uh, so 
what I understand from what you're trying to do in this kind of a new equilibrium, the Kantian one, uh, you're trying to invoke a, invoke a kind of a normative aspect into economic theory in this sense. Uh, after all, like classical economics is simply like a descriptive field. So even if you get this kind of trust, it's just a descriptive, a descriptive trust in repeated games, something generated out of description, not a kind of um, an ethical theory, like as Kant is developing in the critique of uh, practical reason, for instance. So here uh, I'm asking um, about this kind of normativity in economic theorization. Um, is it really something like the community will accept, like I mean, the theorist, or is something like economics has to be restricted to kind of descriptive uh, uh, understanding of how economic phenomena are? Or this is what again they're kind doing a kind of gestalt shift. You're moving into kind of normative aspects into how you should think about theorization about economic theory. I think this is a positive theory as well as a normative theory. I'm saying it does describe lots of cooperative situations. I gave those examples that are on the board. I think this theory does a better example of describing how people behave in those situations than Nash equilibrium does. So I don't restrict it to being simply a normative theory. Now, when we get to the definition of Kantian equilibrium in games that are not symmetric, which I didn't do in the, in the talk, it's on my slides, but I didn't get to it, then it's a more complicated conception. Uh, it's still much simpler than Nash equilibrium with repeated games, but it's more complicated than the simple Kantian equilibrium that I described here. And so there you might say it's mainly a pre prescriptive theory, it's showing people how they can cooperate if they desire to, rather than a descriptive one. But for that you have to read more of the, of the paper I circulated. I did circulate a paper about it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, I I have a horrible feeling I have the same question again. <laughs> like, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of Kant as a theorist, but for me the categorical imperative only makes sense if the group is always at a very high level of abstraction. If the group can be um, oligopolists, for example, or oligarchs or tyrants, then any morality that was ever in Kant vanishes. This becomes a theory of cooperative exploitation. Um, so I'm not sure what it adds. And I also want to come back to this question of, of real life that someone behind me raised. Like, I like the underlying idea. It would be nice if everyone was nice. Um, and we are capable of cooperation. But it doesn't change the fact that we've all been raised in societies that by and large teach us not to be nice. And by and large teach us not to cooperate and teach us to compete to the point that, you know, an exercise you see as cooperative, like voting, can return a result like Donald Trump in an allegedly free democracy. Um, which would be my final point, which is that you know, this quest... That, it's a sort of ongoing problem I have with economics that we assume rational actors in possession of enough information to understand their self-interest and every time we turn on the TV we kind of get categorical proof that those conditions don't hold. I agree that we're going through a period when um, self self-interested, non-cooperative behavior seems primary in many parts of the world, but I don't think that that's the uh, explanation of why we were successful as a species. I think without the ability to cooperate, we would not have been successful as a species, economically successful. Uh, we'd be more like the chimpanzees. There are even biologists who argue that the reason we have large brains is because we we already had a tendency to cooperate. The argument basically goes as follows, that large brains are necessary for carrying out complex tasks. What's a complex task? Well, it's one that has to involve a lot of people. So it has to involve coordination. So there is even this theory that that's why the large brain evolved. So I think you're underestimating the amount of cooperation that exists. I also think it's true that in capitalist societies, the people who make it to the top are the Nash players. They're the people who don't mind stepping on other people. 
very hard to become a billionaire if you never step on anybody else. So I think there are lots of ordinary people in society who, for instance, choose their occupations not with an eye to maximizing their wealth, but with an eye to doing something good for society. I really think there are lots of people who think that way. Well, yeah, professors, professors, nurses, uh, social workers, teachers, but lots of people. I mean, uh, scientists who become scientists rather than opening up firms. Of course, now we see scientists also opening up, you know, IT firms. But there's a lot of pressure, certainly, in capitalist society to make money. That's the money is life's report card. It shows how how valuable you are to make a lot of money. You show your report card, right? Which is your castle that you live in. Uh, I don't think that's uh, part of human nature. I think that's that's something that we have at this stage in history. I'm interested in changing the way people think. And I have a small bailiwick. My bailiwick is other economists. That's mainly who might try to convince. So I want to put forth a theory which uh, shows that cooperation can be thought of at the same level of abstraction and mathematical sophistication as our theories of competition, because I think that will get economists to see cooperation in more places than they normally look for it. They normally just see competition going on, and they tend to be blind or overlook the cases of cooperation that exist, because they don't have a good theory for it. Okay, uh, my question is, is simply that Khan talks about uh, during the Enlightenment, and he points out that we should not resist uh, or uh, whatever government that is tyrannical, tyrannical or whatever, or undemocratic. So my question is, how do we, how are we talking about cooperation from a Kantian side, while things like revolutions and cooperations of such, whether social movements or social non-movement, create change, while at the same time we're using Kant to justify this cooperation? I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm not in any sense taking on all of Kant's thoughts and claiming to uh, agree with him. I'm just using the one phrase that he had and saying it's a convenient way to describe this kind of optimization. Okay, so, and this applies to, to you too. You said, well, this shouldn't be called, this Kantianism doesn't bring anything because Kant wouldn't have thought oligopolists were being moral. I agree, he wouldn't have. I don't mean to be making this as a major philosophical statement. I'm just using the Kantian phrase as a mnemonic to think about mathematically what this optimization concept is doing. Uh, in smaller communities like uh, in a family or in a workplace, it's very easy to envisage uh, uh, relations as cooperative because you see directly the benefits that other people provide you. I see exactly what my father does, I see exactly what my mother does. But in a larger community like a state, or, um, or even the global market, I very rarely see what other people bring forth to me. And hence, we see people all the time undertaking actions that are very detrimental to other people, but they're supposed to, like, supposed to have similar interests too. Is it possible to envisage uh, cooperation on a much larger scale, as in, in a country or globally? Well, as I said at the beginning of my talk, we see that all the time. We see it with tax collection. I mean, you see it in all kinds of activities where people take the cooperative action where they don't have to. They could actually profit more personally by not doing so. As I say, there are lots of economists who've shown that the fines in the United States, the probability of getting inspected on your tax return, and the fine you pay if you are, if you are audited and found to have cheated, the expected fine, in other words, is much smaller than the expected gain from cheating. Yet cheating is, doesn't, is not ubiquitous. Now, that equilibrium doesn't exist everywhere. I think in Greece, people don't pay their taxes because they're not going to be caught. In Egypt, many, many people don't pay their taxes because the probability of getting caught is too small or what you have to pay if you do get caught. So I'm not saying this is the equilibrium in every country, 
But I would say in most highly advanced democracies, and I there do not include Greece, I do not include Italy in that statement, uh, people pay taxes mainly not because of fear of getting caught, because they understand that taxes are used for public purposes and they want to contribute. Even though the Nash behavior is not to contribute. But I think there are all kinds of other examples. Again, I'm not sure it applies in Egypt. I, I think there's much less trust. I mean, there are lots of experimenters who've shown, behavioral economists who've shown that levels of trust increase with levels of development. Levels of trust are quite low in countries with low levels of development. But in countries with high level of development, trust is quite high. Well, let me give another example. In, I like this example from the Nordic countries. If you're a, a mother, a young mother in Sweden, and you have an infant, you go to the grocery store, and you leave the infant in the pram outside the store on the sidewalk. In the United States, if you do that, you get arrested. It's never done, but sometimes there's a Scandinavian in the United States who's just come as a family, and she does that. There was a case in Manhattan a few years ago. She left her kid in the pram outside the store, and the store manager called the cops and had her arrested. But in, in Denmark, you see that all the time. So it's a level of trust that doesn't exist here in, in my country. Um. Okay, uh, so I, I find it interesting that you, epistemologically, that you choose to start from kind of a natural experiment kind of ways. And I want to hear your thoughts about, doesn't that, you know, the whole Darwinian approach and how it had negative impacts on the development of uh, social sciences. So why would we even want to ask that question, whether, you know, is this a constructed learned behavior or that's natural and open that door? This is one. And two, um, I mean, going back to levels of trust and development, I would, and I don't have numbers because I don't do numbers, but again, uh, looking at places like Egypt and Bolivia and other, you know, um, places I've, I've lived in, actually there, there are some forms of social capital in terms of uh, trust networks and cooperation that actually by virtue of basic needs have to exist in those um, countries whereby yeah. people have to chip in to do this right. um, and that. Right. So. Well, so you're saying there is trust in a country like Egypt. Of course there's trust. I mean, you still do live in Cairo, which has how many? 10 million people? Uh, 20. 20 million people living fairly peacefully, right? If you had 20 million chimpanzees living in that close, you know, <laughs> close, to, you, there'd be murders, you know, murder rate would be 10% of the population a day or something. So, of course there is trust in all human societies. I'm just saying it's greater in more highly developed societies. And now that's not because they have more trust, they're more highly developed. It's probably the other way around. That, I'm sorry. It's not because they're more developed, they have more trust. It's the other way around. I think it's the increased trust that those societies have developed encourages, it, encourages economic development, makes possible economic development. Now, you asked a question about evolution. Of course, I think that these things have an evolutionary basis. I mean, the difference between us and chimpanzees, the, the, the level, the degree of cooperation has an evolutionary basis. Now, the, I want to get back to the altruism point. I think you made it. The, the important, an important thing to observe is that my theory does not require altruism. It does not require that people care about other people. Well, you may say it's nicer to build a theory in which people care about other people, and that's why they cooperate with them. But I think that that's uh, backwards. And the, it, I think that we should build on the machinery that evolution has given us, that machinery is our ability to cooperate. We don't naturally love people who live, you know, 10 to 5,000 5, miles away from us. We don't necessarily feel altruistic towards people who are very different from us. I think it's much more effective to build a theory of a a good society based upon exploiting our tendencies to cooperate with each other 
than our tendencies towards altruism. Altruism doesn't spread much farther than your family and extended friends. And I think the people who are trying to extend that much farther are sort of barking up the wrong tree. I do think, however, it's possible to cooperate with other people whom we don't know. Let's take the question of global warming, which is, I think, the major example of a public bad that has to be solved by human society in the next 20, 50 years. I mean, if we're going to avoid really destroying a large part of you know, what we consider to be civilization, I think we have to solve that problem. That's going to require cooperation. I don't think it requires altruism. And I think cooperation is sufficient to solve those. Uh, set the microphone towards that side. The, the example is uh, very interesting that you're making up here, but uh, it, it, it just gets uh, I noticed that they, they uh, basically come from a particular kind of countries, uh, group of countries, small group of countries in that very far north of the, of the, of the universe or the our planet. It looks like more like a country or cultural specific behavior rather than species uh, specific behavior. I don't see the same patterns of cooperation or levels of cooperation achieved in other cultures if you go beyond the, the Nordic or Scandinavian nations. So the culture is a factor here. One other thing, the, 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 the seven, the seven uh, uh, examples here that you give on the screen are uh, uh, Conventionally, not economic, actually. If, if economics is about the production of wealth, about the pricing of goods, if it's about how you advertise, how you control the market, etc. None of this is, not, is about economics. Even though, yes, it, there is a, a great deal of cooperation uh, uh, implied in such a kind of, uh, of activity. So I would say here what we're talking about is about uh, 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 cooperation in non-economic uh, domains of action, so explaining human behavior, cooperative human behavior, but not necessarily in economics and other things. So, so with this would, would rather complement maybe the, uh, the Nash equilibrium, because Nash equilibrium is, is maybe about economics, but it fails to explain uh, other kind of behavior, cooperative behavior in other domains, in non-economic non domains, in non-competitive uh, arenas, I would say. The, 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 uh, the conventional say we deal with this uh, issue of, uh, of people cooperating by forcing them to cooperate by uh, the problem of the public good and how the public good is provided, how people are, how the, the, the activities are regulated in a way so that people are, uh, the public good can be provided without people taking advantage or uh, dealing with the, with the problem of the free riders, etc. Uh, so it's a rather complement but in a particular kind of behavior or activities that are not addressed by the conventional economic game theory or you know, theory. So okay, what I show in the, in the, in the grown-up version of this talk, which I didn't do because it was mainly students here, is that uh, there, you can look at, you can formalize what the free rider problem is, and you can formalize what the tragedy of the commons is, and you can show that Nash equilibrium in games, which are called monotone increasing, which are games where public goods are being produced. What's a monotone increasing game? It's a game where everyone's payoff function is an increasing function of the contributions of the other players. So that's like contributions to a public good. It's good for me if you contribute to the public good. A monotone decreasing game is a game where everybody's payoff function is a decreasing function of the contributions of the other players. That's a common pool resource problem. We're all fishing on a lake. Uh, there are decreasing returns to scale in labor on the lake. The fishing of other fishers decreases the productivity of the lake to me. So it, what I show is that Nash equilibrium is always, always Pareto inefficient in monotone increasing games. That's called the free rider problem. And Nash equilibrium is always Pareto inefficient in monotone decreasing games. That's called the tragedy of the commons. And now, 
the, conscious, the new statement is Kant in equilibrium is always Pareto efficient in both those kinds of games. So that shows that Kant in equilibrium solves the two major problems of Nash equilibrium, which is to say the free rider problem and the tragedy of the commons in all games. And that includes a lot of economics. So you're not right. I mean, these examples, I agree, aren't primarily economic examples, but this has tremendous applicability to economics. I show that if you inject Kantian reasoning into the labor supply decision of workers in the general equilibrium model, the Aradigma model, then at any level of income taxation, you get Pareto efficient equilibrium. You completely solve the deadweight loss of taxation. The deadweight loss of taxation is a phenomenon associated with the fact that workers are choosing their labor supplies in the Nash way. If they choose them in the Kantian way, you can choose the tax rate exogenously. People can vote exogenously on what the tax rate should be, and the equilibrium would be pretty efficient at any tax rate, even a 100% tax rate. So this has tremendous economic application. It's just I didn't get a chance to get to it in this uh, in talk at this level. I think we have exhausted you. So <laughs> we thank, we please join me in thanking.